Mark Ein is the CEO of Venture House, which is an investment company here in Washington, D.C. Mark has an amazing track record as an investor, as a CEO, as an entrepreneur, as an athlete, as a sports team owner, and as a philanthropist in town. His bio is, uh, is in the program. He's done so many things at such a young age. I want to be like you when I grow up, except I'm a little older than you, so I don't think that's possible. But um, Mark is also the CEO of Capital Acquisition Corporation, which is a NASDAQ-traded acquisition vehicle. He is the chairman of Castle Systems, which is the nation's leader in providing managed security systems for office buildings. Um, he, is, he has invested in numerous companies that have been very successful. They've either gone public or merged into companies such as uh, Sirius XM Satellite, Nextel, American Tower, Cybernet, and Matrix. Uh, Mark is also the founder and owner of the World Team Tennis Franchise, World Champion, for three years, Washington Castles. Um, awesome, a lot of fun. We, they have a 32 game winning streak and if they win their next match, they will tie the Los Angeles Lakers for the uh, most consecutive wins in any sport. So come on out and support our local tennis team. We've got Martina Hingis, the Williams sisters have played before, the greatest doubles player in the world, Leander Pays, is on our team, so I want to hear all about that, Mark. And um, Mark also has done a lot for the community. He's been named Business Leader of the Year by uh, the D.C. Chamber of Commerce, Entrepreneur of the Year by Nifty, and he was inducted into the Mid-Atlantic Tennis Hall of Fame as well. He serves on several boards. He's the chairman of the D D.C. Public Schools Education Fund, does a lot for the uh, education community and for kids around town. And... Um, uh, Mark, I, I mean, it's, it's, you've done so much, and we're grateful to have you here today. So uh, without further ado, um, uh, Mark's going to speak a little bit, and we'll go Q&A with, uh, with the audience. So um, thank you. I want to thank Tian. You know, uh, being, coming out here, brings back a lot of memories. Uh, when I started my firm, I was over in the building uh, where the Palm is. And back in the um, 99 kind of uh, tech wave 1.0, thanks, um, there was a guy, a man named Mario Marino, who had been very successful, who decided that um, <clears throat> what he wanted to do was create forums where he would bring the community together. And it was really, I think, core to why this region has built a successful entrepreneurial and technology community. And I used to go out in sort of the late 90s to all of his events, like everyone did. And it was the reason he kept people together, he educated people, he inspired people through those. And Mario has since moved on uh, and mainly lives in Cleveland. But uh, fortunately, we're very fortunate that really incredible people, incredible entrepreneurs like Tian, who have been so successful in their own right, decide to continue to uh, uphold that wonderful tradition of finding, creating forums for people to come together, which are so important. And so, Tian, thank you for organizing this and everything you do. Big round of applause for um, Tian. I would say that in addition, Tian's a pretty mean tennis player himself, and uh, and the only person in his family who's better than them his, than him is his son, who is much better than him. <laughs> but that's okay, because he plays number one at St. Albans, I think, and he's, uh, he's a great tennis player, so thanks. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, uh, how many of you have been to a Castles match? All right, good. And then the rest, so every time I speak or talk to people and they say they haven't been, I get a little bit of a sheepish, like, no, I haven't been yet or whatever. But I, I love that because the fact is we sell out every night and still whenever we speak to a crowd, only half the people or less sometimes have actually been to a match. So we just view that as opportunity. So everyone who didn't raise their hand, uh, we hope that you'll come out and, and check us out. Um, as Tian said, I've been an entrepreneur and investor. I've built companies. And I will say for sure that the single most um, meaningful, impactful experience of my entire career has been the, ten the team. And it's interesting, there's something about sports that's so tangible. I mean, you see the result on the court, you see it in the stands, you see it in the community. It sort of brings everything together. And the fact that we started this from scratch, um, we've obviously had success in a lot of 
areas, but really building this from the ground up and the lessons I've learned from this have been the most impactful of my career. And I, in the rest of the things I do, spend a lot of time actually bringing the things that I've learned from the tennis team into our businesses. And a lot of times those businesses are a lot bigger than the team and the team's organization, but still the lessons I've found are so transferable. So I love to talk to crowds about what we've learned, and that's what I want to do today. I'm going to start with a bit of an introduction for the team and the background, so for people who haven't been, and maybe it'll help, but also for people who've been, it give you a little bit of an insight. And then, and then mainly move to lessons learned that I've learned from building the team uh, and apply them to business, and then we'll open it up for Q&A at the, at the end. So uh, this is, and you heard it in the video, these were our founding principles. Uh, it was bring the community together, help local charitable partners, create a center of high-quality fun activities, and expose tennis to a wider audience. You, th this literally was the first slide I ever made in a PowerPoint presentation, is this is what we wanted to set out to accomplish. You will note that winning was not one of the original founding principles. Actually, it had nothing to do with what was happening on the court. I really viewed this that we could use the tennis as an anchor to build a stadium somewhere in the middle of Washington, D.C. that would bring people together for the tennis, but then we could use it for a whole bunch of other things. Interestingly, what I learned our first year, and this is going to sound so obvious, and intellectually it's obvious, but emotionally I didn't really get it, is is uh, winning, and I think winning in sports or in business uh, matters a lot. Um, and it sounds so obvious, but our first year where we didn't win that much, um, we would still bring together great crowds. We s sold out almost every match that first year, but when we would lose, there'd be all this energy built up for two and a half hours in our stadium, and then we would lose, and the energy would totally dissipate, and people would leave kind of, it'd be quiet. And then the couple matches where we did win, their energy would continue and people would be excited and they'd want to go to the bars and the restaurants and talk about what they had just seen. And again, it sounds so obvious, but emotionally I didn't get it. And I see Ken Harvey there, so he knows all about this, um, that when you win, it really matters. And uh, it matters because our objectives weren't really about winning. It was making a difference in the community, getting people excited. And while I, we have had really great success on the court, I don't expect it will be at this level forever. Um, it really did make a difference, mainly because it helped us do the other things that we wanted to do. Um, we've played host to sold out crowds for our matches, for concerts and other events. Um, we have led the league in every measure of uh, revenues by very large margins, even though we are by far the newest team in the league. Um, this is a little bit about uh, what we've done on the court. So the league's been around for 37 years. Billie Jean King started it in 1975, I think. Um, and until 2011, no team had ever gone undefeated for an entire season. No, it had never happened. And our team managed to pull that off in 2011. And then last year at this time, people would say, well, you're about to start another year. What do you hope to do? And you said, well, of course we can't go undefeated again because it had never happened in history. So we're just going to try hard and hopefully at the end of the day we'll do well. And lo and behold, the team was unbelievable again and won every match for the second time. So it was the only two times ever that there was a perfect season. And so as Tien said, our 32 match winning streak is the second longest winning streak in the history of pro sports and we're very focused on opening night where we will try to tie the LA Lakers and even more focused on the second night where hopefully we will then bring to Washington DC in our community the longest winning streak in the history of pro sports but it is amazing and uh, and when I talk about lessons learned I'll talk about why I think that happened because it doesn't it is a lot more than just having really good players and we've won the championship three of the last four years. Um, as I mentioned, our core priorities are community and bring people together. Uh, we, are, over the, since we started the team, have given out nearly $800,000 in cash and tickets and uh, rackets, and we do clinics for inner city kids and stuff, and this is, as I said, really at the core of what we try to do. Um, we take pride in our branding. This was something that our friends at SunTrust very much appreciated. Right before the match, Venus said, the sun's in my eyes, I can't see anything do you have a hat or something I can wear? And so SunTrust that night had given out visors, and um, so we said, well, we'll try this on, and it was a national TV match, and 
Lo and behold, Venus, if you can see it on the screen, was wearing a SunTrust visor all night, so they were very happy about that. Probably the only other better branding thing we ever did was the First Lady has come the last two years, and we put pop chips on the table. Um, and uh, that was actually not that expensive for them to do that. They gave us a lot of product, and we liked them, so we put them on the table. And there's a great picture of the First Lady holding a Castles banner in one hand and a bag of pop chips in another. That's, <laughs> I can't promise that to all of our sponsors, but just sometimes being there, half of life is just showing up, I guess. So, or putting the pop chips on the table, one of the two. Um, this is our newest player this year, Martina Hingis, who is one of the all-time greats. People forget she's only 32 years old. She's the same age as Venus. Uh, she has really dominated our league the last two years. Um, really, outside of the top 10, uh, no one can beat her. She's currently coaching a girl who's 17 in the world. And we talked over the weekend where the girl just won the doubles title in Madrid. And I said, when you guys play, who won? She goes, of course I still I beat her. You know, And uh, she has this great combination of confidence, but also the skills to back it up. So we're excited to have Martina here. She uh, Last three years, she's been on the other end of our team. And she said, I always want to play for you guys. So we got her on the team. Um, you guys saw in the video the atmosphere. It's really electric. It's exciting. For people who haven't been, it literally is like tennis in a hockey or basketball environment. In fact, the game day people that we use are the Capitals. We use the people who are the producers of the Capitals game day to do our game day. So it's really electric. Uh, people get into it. Is This is not your grandmother's tennis match for sure. Um, but on the court, it's deadly serious and intense competition. But in the, fans, in the stands, it's fun. And that was sort of one of Billie Jean King's visions about this, which she's like, this is how tennis should be. This is what will make tennis the most popular. You see more pictures in the stands. Uh, this is our team. So we have Venus Williams, who's going to play the first week for us, Martina Hingis the last two weeks. And then every night we have Leander Pays, who Tan mentions, one of the great doubles players of all time. Earlier this year, I think he was third or fourth in the world. He's perennially winning Grand Slams. Bobby Reynolds, great American player who's been awesome for us the last four years. Anastasia Rodianova, who played on the Australian Olympic team, and our, um, and our very energetic coach, Murphy Jensen, who's a well-known personality and been a great coach. Uh, this is our schedule this year, so uh, it's on your, in your chairs, and you can see it's a short season. It's July 8th through the 28th. People always say, why is your season so short? And compared to... Other sports leagues were very short, but this, in fact, is the longest tennis event in the world. The longest tennis events are the Grand Slams, which are two weeks, and we're three weeks. So getting players off the tour for this period of time isn't easy, but they love playing, and they do it. So it's going to be another great summer. Um, our stadium is down for, I think, ho hopefully most of you know, down where Hogates used to be on the waterfront. Um, and it's been a magical location right on the water. Great breeze in the summer, incredible views and vistas, and... Uh, a really special place. Uh, this will be our last summer there. They're redeveloping the site into a $2 billion mixed-use development over the next 10 years that I always say in 10 years people will look back, I'm 100% sure of this down there, and say, why wasn't this always considered one of the best parts of our city? And it really has been forgotten about. And I, one of the things I love is through the tennis we've been able to bring people back down there and they come down and see it and say, wow, this is incredible. I can't believe I haven't been here, and it's six minutes from downtown Washington, D.C., so I know we'll look back and find it hard to believe that it, w it wasn't a center of life in our city um, down the road. Uh, I, this is what we like to think, and I think it is one of the hottest tickets of the summer, not just because all the matches sell out, but because everyone comes. Uh, you see the First Lady, Valerie Jarrett, came to m most of our matches last year, the President's Economic Team, including Gene Sperling, our huge fans come very often, the learners, media, sports, business. It's been one of the fun things is just sort of everyone wants to uh, come out. Um, we do do a lot of other events. I said this was core to our mission. So these are a series of events we've done in the current place. We had a sold out concert with Thievery Corp and Charity Benefits Walk This Way, Mia Ham Celebrity Soccer, Soccer Challenge. I don't know if you guys, it's a little hard to see, but in the lower right picture, there's a soccer player here, number 24. See who's the first person who can guess who it is. So he's a basketball player who grew up in Italy, and soccer was his first love. Kobe, Kobe Bryant, exactly. So that was Kobe playing down there in the Mia's soccer thing. Uh, we have some great events this summer. We have um, The Roots is playing down there in a big concert. 
um, I think in uh, June. And so uh, we love we love to use the stadium for these other events whenever we can. Um, uh, you see, we've had a lot of great recognition by the city and the community for what we've done. We got recognized on center court at the U.S. Open when we won the championships, and it's been great. As I said, this is really uh, the core reason we did this was to give back to the community. So our community programs are uh, are several fold. One, we just support uh, we support over a hundred local charitable organizations uh, with auction donations and all kinds of stuff like that. Grants. Um, we give out every, as I mentioned, every match sell, sells out. We give out every night between 100 and 200 free tickets to kids, even though every match sells out. Um, we give them to organizations who bring the kids with adult supervision. Um, we think that's really important to uh, expose the sport to, uh, to young people in our community and especially community, especially kids who don't otherwise have the chance to do that. Um, we give out 1,000 free tennis rackets every year. So um, uh, we, we, uh, any kid uh, 12 and under who comes to a match who doesn't have a tennis racket, we give them a free tennis racket. Um, and when it comes to a clinic who doesn't have a racket, we give a free racket too. Um, and, then, uh, and then we do these clinics where uh, Venus, Serena, our players both bring kids in the stadium and then also... Um, uh, and then also go into the community and do clinics. And this is one of the really great things. So one of the reasons that Venus and Serena do this is because um, when they were kids, they went to a world team tennis clinic in Long Beach when they were little kids and met Billie Jean King when they were eight, nine. And they still credit that with being one of the reasons that they were so inspired to pursue the sport of tennis. So when they come, they want to do the same thing in our community, which... Uh, I think is really, uh, which is really special. Um, got a lot of great press for what we've done, been recognized all over the place. My favorite one's the top middle one, where Serena at uh, the Olympics last year, she said, what's it like playing the Olympics at Wimbledon? And she said, it's crazy, because it's usually so quiet, but people are so rowdy here, it's like going, being playing at a Castles match, uh, which we'll take that comparison. That was, uh, that was a great thing she said to NBC last year. Um, great local press coverage. Um, uh, our matches are on Comcast Sportsnet and on the Tennis Channel. Um, this is a big part of how we got the team going. Was uh, We have a very active grassroots uh, ambassadors program where we have 65 people who represent the local tennis community in, the, in 50 clubs around the region. And they, we bring the team and the players and the coach out to come out and do appearances there. And, um, and in return, they help us sort of promote the team. Uh, the fan base has been fantastic and growing like crazy. Um, here are some of our corporate partners, great, great group of partners. So this is just, a, before I get into lessons learned, I just want to show because all this stuff is great I know, uh, for all the impact we've had in the stands and on the court, but I know everyone in here is a business. I will say that this is not a business. If, if my um, business career was determined by how good I've been at driving profits here, I would not be standing here today. Um, I always call this my biggest accidental not-for-profit, but it's definitely a double bottom line business, or there is no bottom line. Uh, so it does a lot of good stuff, and I'm super happy about it. But on the top line, uh, we've been quite successful, and this is a comparison of our team with the other teams in our league. So this is every, this is the rest of the teams, and then this is us. And so you'll see that uh, our revenues are four and a half times the average of the other teams, three times the second highest team. Our revenues are, um, our revenues are higher than some uh, ATP pro tournaments. Um, and if you did it on a per seat basis, if you look at how many seats we have to sell over our season versus like a basketball or hockey team, we're actually considerably higher than that. So in terms of driving top line, all the lessons I'm going to talk about are applicable too to what's actually happened in terms of the, at least the revenue side. Our general manager, Kevin Wins here, he will blame me for the expense line because... Uh, um, and we have a lot of discussions about it, but we try to do this first class, and as I said, our mission isn't really, um, if it was up to Kevin, we would make a profit, um, for sure, but, uh, but I messed that up. But we, um, we definitely try to do everything first class. We also try to give back a lot, and so uh, we're very proud of, um, 
of the the, res, the revenue side, and uh, and we're working on the rest. In terms of league average. So how does this happen? Why? How does all this happen? Why does it all come together? And I always say that um, I think that the the punchline on this is that this is really about the um, the whole being much bigger than the sum of the parts. And that's really the bottom line here, is there's something about what's come together um, in our office, on the court with our players, in the community that makes the whole bigger than the sum of the parts. Our players are good players. We have really good players. Arguably, we have the best players in the league, but not by that much and not always. In fact, over the 32 matches we've won, 10 have been, well, we've had 10 match points against us. 10 match points against us, and eight of the 32 matches were decided by one game, um, and 11 of the 32 by two games. So somehow, every time it's come down to crunch time, every single time over two years, our players have managed to figure out how to pull it off. And I will tell you that it has now been, I think it's been 1,043 days since we last lost a match. Um, I actually calculated that this morning. I think it's been 89 million seconds since we last lost a match. <laughs> I have it down to the exact number of seconds. But, but, um, but it is a staggering thing. And, and, and again, you can look at however you measure it. It's been really incredible. But it really is, I think, a story of the, sum, the whole being bigger than the sum of the parts. This was the first, I mentioned our value statement, this was literally the first slide that we, ever, that we ever made, and you can see what it said, and we have never changed our mission statement from the beginning. So I know people, when they talk about building a business and they talk about the importance of a mission statement and core values, I can't tell you how important that is in business, in anything you do. And having a set of core values that everyone understands is the first step, and it's the most important step to make sure that people are all on the same page. And I'd also say that because winning or driving revenues wasn't our core, that was not a core value, that I think people feel like they're playing for something bigger than themselves. And I think if you asked our players about it, they all feel this, like, this isn't just about tennis, this isn't, this is about, like, being, representing our community. And I think the people in the office feel like well, this is representing our community. And then the fans feel like we're really part of something special and they see how much people care about it. And you get this incredible effect of everything uh, feeding off itself towards higher and higher heights. Um, culture uh, is what follows from having strong core values. And I'd say that, you know, because this has been a startup from scratch and a lot of people here who do startups have this opportunity, when the nice thing about a startup is that you can create the culture from scratch, you can embed it in the DNA of what you do. Um, I've spent a bunch of my career buying businesses and trying to improve them or building them from a platform. And I'd say that um, I love that strategy. I love actually starting from a platform and existing business and trying to grow. The single hardest part about that is that organizations have a culture embedded in their DNA and changing it is so hard. It's so hard and um, I mean, it's, just, it's, so, it's so difficult. And the one great opportunity you have when you start something from scratch is you can create the culture how you want and as long as you do the things to reinforce it, um, you can, as I said, embed it in the fabric of your organization. There's a great line that I always think about that someone said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And, um, and I fully believe that. I think that at the end of the day, a strong culture will beat a good strategy every day. And it's funny, too, because when I was in business school, <coughs> people would say, oh, this soft stuff, organizational behavior, culture. It's like they said, you guys, won't, you guys won't appreciate this for like 20 years. Like today you're going to care about finance and all this other stuff. But in 20 years, you'll come back and appreciate it. So I went back to my 20th business school reunion and I had to eat crow and admit to my professors that in fact, they're right, that when I was younger, I didn't appreciate that this is really what matters. But I 100% believe that this is the stuff that makes the difference for winning organizations, whether you're a sports team or a business or a not for profit or whatever it is that that you do. Um, so you have core values, you're trying to build a culture. The next thing is consistency and alignment. And we talk a huge amount about alignment is that everything has to be consistent with your core values and your culture. And I think this is where organizations often get into trouble because 
oftentimes there's temptation to, to get a short-term gain that's inconsistent with your core values or inconsistent with your culture, but you feel like, gosh, I've just, I'll make this one exception this one time because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be good. And I'll tell you, to me, that's the kiss of death. And oftentimes you have to make pretty serious short-term sacrifices in terms of things you don't do, opportunities you miss, because it's not consistent with what you are or what you want your organization to be. And so to me, the most consistent you can stick to it, the most pure you can be, um, is is absolutely critical because then people people just get confused when they're like, well, you say all this stuff, but then we just did this. I don't understand. Like, are we doing this or are we doing this? So the more you can just do this, which is what you want and what you, you espouse to be and aspire to be, to me, the most successful you're going to be. Um, and I'll tell you that the alignment isn't just uh, the office staff. I'll tell you that we also include the players in this. So one of the things that we do, especially for our longtime players, is we actually include them in our emails that go to our whole staff. We uh, invite them to call into our weekly team meetings because we think that the more they understand about what we're trying to do broad, more broadly outside of on the court, the more they'll buy into it. And secondly, they actually give us a lot of good ideas. I mean, they've been on tour for 10, 15 years. They know tennis, they travel the world. And, um, <clears throat> and so we actually learn a lot from them. Um, and it's interesting, I um, was at the NBA All-Star Game this year and I was talking to the GM of the Spurs and he told me they do the same thing. So if you guys think about great sports cultures, you certainly would think the San Antonio Spurs is one of them, right? A team that wins all the time and yes, they've had Tim Duncan for a long time, but you just scratch your head, it's like, they're not that flashy, you know, they have good players, they're solid, but you're like, how do, they always at the, how do they always do this year in and year out? And to me, it all comes down to culture. And he told me one of the things they do is what, what we've done is they bring the players in. I was there actually with Roger Mason, which is how I met him, because Roger played for them. And he said that they would bring the players in and talk to them about the business side, how they, just about everything behind the scenes, not on the court, and include them in those discussions. Um, same reason that we did it. And he said it's great because, A, mainly the organization did it because they wanted to learn from the players who've played, who go travel to another 30 arenas all year long, but also have played for other organizations. Um, but then Roger told me it makes you feel so much more connected to the organization because they just don't view us as someone who's on the court. They actually view us as part of our organization. And I, I thought it was so interesting, and it is something that we've really done. And again, I think our players really strongly feel like they're not just there to play on the court, but to be part of the organization. And that creates the alignment that we are so badly trying to uh, create. Um, Team, again, whether it's a sports team or a business team is the most important thing. Um, we talk a lot about it as it's reason. There's a few reasons that it's as complimentary pieces. One is because every slide you have to start with the letter C. Um, so I had to think of one. But secondly, because this is really what I think, is when you think about teams, is you think about not individuals as individuals, but how do they complement each other. And when I've built companies um, and uh, started companies and everything else, we always think about how a team fits together. You're not hiring individuals, but you think about what are individual strengths and weaknesses and how do you surround them with people who are complementary to them. Um, and uh, you know what happens when you do that is you get a, strong, a really strong culture. And so I will tell you, for, for our team, we've had a few players who did not fit that well in other teams. And actually people, this has happened a bunch to us, and people traded them to us and sort of snickered because they're like, haha, that person's really difficult or they're not going to try as hard as you think or whatever. And I will tell you, as soon as they come into our court, into our stadium, everything changes. They've been some of our biggest stars who in other places didn't fit, didn't apply themselves, and they came and they're like, whoa, this is different. You know, this is not the way it was, and I better show up and show up 110%. And it's interesting to think about football. You think about the New England Patriots. How many times, like, they bring a Randy Moss in or an Albert Haynes? It's like, they're like, I know they don't fit anywhere else, but they're, they're either going to fit in here, which we think they will, or, they, or they'll be gone. But we're okay with that because we think our culture will be more important than each individual player. And, and I also think back for those of you who remembers the 1987 NFL season, the strike season. You guys remember that? Yeah, remember that? that? So to me, I remember I was sort of quasi a kid at the time. And uh, if you guys remember, um, uh, that was the year that they played three games where the NFL players went on strike. And most teams had 
a lot of their play, most players did not cross the picket line, but a few players on most teams did. And some teams, I think, Ken had uh, more than others. And the Redskins had zero players cross the picket line, zero players cross the picket line. And at the time, with the culture of the Redskins and the Joe Gibbs coaching, they went 3-0, and beating teams that had, I think one team had a pretty good amount of players who crossed the picket line. But the culture of the team and the organization was so strong that you could bring substitute players in and still win. And to me, that's the sign of a great organization, a great culture, when it doesn't matter who the individuals are that are sitting at the desk or playing on the court or lining up on the field, but they're going to win no matter who's there. And, uh, and, uh, and so we, we aspire to the same. Um, commitment to excellence. Uh, these are pictures of our whole team. This is the office team. Uh, people work super hard. Um, they all uh, really dedicate themselves fully to this. Um, we're tough on people for sure. We set very high objectives, but people really um, rise to the occasion. And um, and uh, you know, I think we all know as leaders that you can't do anything without your broad team, and nothing makes me happier than seeing that picture at the top with all of our people down there celebrating our championship uh, together. Commitment to team, it is unbelievable. It's one of the things that I love to tell people about is how committed our players are to this. Let me give you a few stories. First of all, Leander Pays, who we mentioned, who's top center, has played in more Olympics than any af Asian athlete in history. He's played in six Olympics. Um, <clears throat> when Leander last year went to go to the Olympics, we do a lunch every year in our office where, back to this point about creating alignment, um, where we bring the whole team in and our whole staff. We have about 50 people mid-season who work in the office. And uh, we bring the players in so that everyone can have lunch together, tell stories, and just bond. You know, the players, the interns, everyone. And um, Leander, at the end of it, was leaving for the Olympics that day and was talking about how much this experience meant to him. And he literally started crying. I mean, he was like leaving the Olympics to go play for his country, and he started crying. And I was, I mean, we were all so moved and cracked up about it. And I went down with him that day before he went out to Dulles to the plane, and he was watching the players who were replacing him practice, and he literally started crying again. And it was like, it just meant so much to him, this experience over the last four years. And, um, you know, I think it, it, particularly for these tennis players, because 11 months of the year, and for most of their lives, they're individuals only playing for themselves. They have to watch out for themselves. There's no one who cares for them, really. You know, they might go to a match and have fans, but people aren't passionate about it. And then for three weeks, they come here, and an entire city wants them to win. You know, and entire stands are there cheering them on. They have 50 people in the office who will do anything they need to make their, to get them ready to play. And it creates this bond and deep emotion that's amazing. I'll tell you another incredible story is um, Venus, who's become a friend. Uh, someone who worked for her told me, and she subsequently told me too, that Venus and Serena have a trophy room in their house that has all their trophies. But her World Team Tennis trophy is one of only four trophies that she actually keeps in her bedroom and looks at every day because it just means that much to her. And again, I think it's just about playing for a team, you know, and uh, tennis, it, you don't usually get that, but when these players come together and play for a team, again, I think they feel a higher calling, like there's something that just means that much more. And I could go to what all of our players have sacrificed, but it's really quite incredible. Um, commitment to fans, our customers, uh, we have a saying in the office, and people know that, I mean, actually, we don't have a saying. I don't have to say anything. People in the office know that if there is a conflict between making our fans happy and anything else, making the fans happy wins. And I would say that it, that didn't happen instantly. Like, we had incidents, and people would say, well, we didn't want to do this, we couldn't do that, whatever. But now they know, and I actually never have to ask, that if it's a conflict between serving our customers and anything else, that serving the customer wins. And, um, and it's been great because the fans have been so good to us. They are the ones that make this possible. Uh, obviously, they buy the tickets, but also the emotion they've put into it, as I said, has been our inspiration. And again, talking about alignment and how everyone knows uh, uh, how important our fans are, if you look at the upper right corner, you can see during a rain delay, that's actually Bobby Reynolds, our star 
singles player and Arena Rodinova, one of our stars, uh, actually squeegeeing off the court to get it ready after a rain delay. So you want to talk about alignment to goals and commitment of everyone, that pretty much, uh, that pretty much says it all. Um, so this is something that I, uh, in everything I do, probably I drive people more crazy on this point than anything else because I believe that the one common thread of every great organization is they're always trying to get better. They're always trying to learn is figure out what you do well and do more of it and figure out what you don't do well and figure out how to get better at it. And uh, this lesson I learned actually right down the street. I was um, on the board of a company called LCC International, one of the early big wireless engineering firms. We took it public in the 90s. And uh, on the board, we had a man named Arno Penzias who won the Nobel Prize. He discovered the Big Bang. So Arno was head scientist at Bell Labs. He um, <laughs> discovered the Big Bang. And, um, and we're sitting there in a meeting, and like every meeting, little things are going wrong. And we're talking about the problems. We're talking about the problems. And then one day in the middle of the meeting, Arno just starts pounding the table. He's like, when are we going to stop? When are we going to stop? And Arno can get very emotional. It's a little early in the morning for me to channel my Arno Penzias. But, <laughs> but, um, but he's like, he goes, when are we going to stop spending these meetings, putting out fires, and figure out why these fires keep starting. And again, it's one of those things that sounds so obvious, but people ask me the most important lesson I've learned in business. It was that moment because it was like, you can, we all can spend all of our time figuring out the problems and solving problems, but at the end of the day, if you get to the root cause of them and figure out why they're happening, A, they, they stop. And you stop putting out fires as opposed to constantly you know, chasing your tail. And I would say that that, to me, is the thing that I has stayed with me more than anything. When we're in the office and stuff goes wrong, we fix the problem, but then we spend the extra time to talk about, now, why did this happen? Do we understand why it happened? What can we fix the thing at the root cause? And honestly, it's not that fun sometimes. Usually people just want to solve the problem and move on, and they don't want to talk about it. And, uh, and I'm just emphatic about it because I think that's the only way you get to higher and higher levels. And I think at the end of the day, people have seen that and they've seen that that's the reason, whether it's the team or other things that we've been involved in, that things do well because you're always getting better. And I also say to me, I think that the, the greatest form of self-actualization and self-confidence is when people get better at something. When you help people get better at something and they realize it, that's like the most empowering thing in the world. And when you help them do things that they thought they couldn't do before, it is the most empowering thing in the world. And so oftentimes while you're in the middle of that, trying to help people do it, it's, uh, it's not always the easiest and sometimes a little painful, but at the end of the day, my experience is 100% of the time, it's what make, makes people feel the best. Set super high goals, help them get there, things that either they weren't good at or couldn't do, help them and as, do that individually as an organization. And to me, that's how you achieve greatness. Uh, communication, we're voracious communicators. Uh, obviously, this shows it on the court, but we do it in the office. We are fanatical about our weekly meeting. No blackberries. Everyone has to come. No excuses. We tape it. If for some reason you can't be there because you're on a safari or something, which is about the only excuse, or you know, in the hospital or something, we tape the call, everyone has to listen to it. You know, if you want alignment and you want to fix problems, I, don't, I learned this the hard way, because how many times you're sitting there and you're like, you get everyone together, a couple people aren't there, a couple people are on their Blackberries, and then the same problem happens. He said, didn't we just talk about it? Oh yeah, but so-and-so wasn't at the meeting. I'm like, well, what good did that do us? We, you know, we invested the time of 30 people to spend an hour to focus on this, and five people couldn't be there or didn't listen, and then the whole thing fell apart. We just wasted everyone's time. So um, again, in today's world where everyone's got ADD and wants to be scattered around, I find short periods of intense focus where everyone is engaged makes all the difference in the world. And just having that discipline is so massively important. Uh, our cohesiveness, I mean, you can see the emotion. We have thousands of these pictures. I really feel like this is our X factor. Uh, it's just how much people care. Um, hard work, obviously, that is a secret to success. Uh, success is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. For sure, that's true. You know, when people ask, again, another thing, when people say, how does this happen? I just say we have more good people who work harder. And at some level, that is really true. Um, people work really hard. They put in the effort, and the results come. 
Uh, competitiveness, obviously, these are athletes, so everyone's competitive. Same thing goes for business. Concentration on the details. We are crazy about the details. You can see last year we made shoes for the players that said 16 and 0 and champs. Uh, they love that. Venus actually wore those at the Olympics. Uh, she went over and wore them at the Olympics. And I can go chapter and verse about it, but how many times people have said to me, they walk in our stadium and they go, God, it just looks like every little detail was thought about. And it actually is, and we execute on it. Again, I show this picture of the shirts, because rather than hand the shirts out, when we do our free shirt night, which is opening night on July 8th, for those of you who would like to come, uh, you will notice that we don't hand them out at the uh, gate, um, but we, we not just put them on the, the chairs, but align them all perfectly. Every little detail uh, we try to think about Compassion, community, and charity, we talked about that as one of our core things. To me, one of the things that makes me the most optimistic about the world in general is this whole notion that in businesses are rewarded for having um, a double bottom line. You know, it's not your motivation. We all, and hopefully you do that for the right reasons because you want to do it. But the amazing thing about the world we live in is people want to align themselves with companies and products where people feel like they're part of something bigger, where they're giving back to the community. I, I have a business that serves the real estate community, Castle Systems, and you know, the whole LEED certification is amazing. It's fantastic. And yes, it does help the environment a bit, but it doesn't really help the tenants that much other than it's like a branding thing. I want to be in a LEED certified building and they get premium rents for that because people want to be in a LEED certified building because it says I care about my environment. I want to be in a, in a, in, in a building that does that. Um, and you can go on and on Project Red that Bono did where they sell products at a premium just because they're red and the money goes to support um, people who need it in, in Africa and on and on and on. And it's, uh, it's great to see that in the world we live in that having a higher calling and giving back is, is rewarded um, in addition to the virtues and the reasons you do it. But it's also is good business. So those are all the C's. Let me tell you a little story to wrap it up and then we'll... Uh, go into Q&A. So I think I just went through eight or nine C's of success, but then there's the last one, which is chance, which is luck. And I want to tell you a story about how luck happened. So 2009, our second season, um, we were not that great that year. We eked into the playoffs, uh, seven and seven, clinched it by winning the last two matches. Um, I was just happy that we had gotten to that point. Um, we ended up playing uh, in, the, in the conference finals, the team in New York that we shouldn't have beaten, and we ended up beating them. And so in the finals, we ended up playing uh, the team with the best record, who I think had only lost one match the whole year. And coincidentally, the way it works in our league uh, that year and most years is that you pick, we pick a, a location before the season to play the final match, the championship match. And it so happened that we had agreed to do it in Washington. So it was in our hometown. So it was really thrilling for us to be able to play in the championship match at home. But I didn't think we had much of a chance to be quite honest, just because of the mismatch. So we get out there, uh, great crowd, July day. And, um, and I don't think we have much of a chance. And just for those of you who haven't been to the match, the way it works is there's five sets, men's and women's singles, men's and women's doubles, and mixed doubles. Most total games win. So it's a set up to five, most total games, uh, most total games wins. And we come out, and our team is so inspired because they're playing in front of the hometown crowd. They just start winning matches. And I'm like, wow, this is uh, going pretty well. But the one thing that... I knew is that the way it also works in our league is that the team with the best record in the finals, usually it's the home team, but in the finals, the team with the best record picks the order. And what you always do is you put your best matchups last. And so they had put their best matchups at the end. And the best matchup by far was the last one where they had the best girl in the league who had only lost once and our girl who I think had only won twice. So I knew that if we didn't have a gigantic league going in the end, that there was no chance that we were going to win. But we're chugging along. We're doing well. The team's inspired. You can see there that at halftime, we were up 15-11. And that's actually not a bad lead, but I still thought this is still not e nearly enough, knowing sort of the matchups that were coming. And so, um, so we're sitting there. It's at, um, it's at halftime. And... Um, and Jack Evans, our city councilman, comes up to me and he goes, Mark, this is the most exciting thing. We haven't had a team in Washington win a championship in so many years since the Redskins. He said, if we win this match, I'm going to have a ceremony for you on the steps of City Hall and give you the key to the city. And I'm like, wow, now I care. Like, I'm like, 
championship would be cool. That would be even more cool. Like that was like, I was like, wow. And I literally, all of a sudden I was like, now I really hope we win this match. And so um, our players come out of halftime and they are so inspired. Um, and this is the first of our two matchups that I figure are really bad matchups. So on the near side is Springfield where they have on the left, this girl, Vanya King, who's won multiple doubles Grand Slams, and Liesl Huber, who is, was number one in the world in doubles and is one of the best women's doubles players of all times. And on our other side was Renee Stubbs, who's very good, but getting she was a little old. It was one of her last years on tour, but good player. And uh, this woman, Olga Puchkova, who we affectionately called Pucci, who um, had a lot of talent but was not very able to focus on it. And... Um, so we thought there's no chance that we're, we thought this was going to not work out too well. Um, but we went off to a 3-1 lead. And so all of a sudden we have an 18-12 lead. And I'm like, wow, this actually, this could happen. Like, I actually think this is possible, that this could happen. Um, and you see Murphy at halftime there with our 18-12 lead. And so um, at, at, at after four games, you switch sides. So, so I'm sitting there like, just keep this going, just keep this going, let's move this fast, let's move this fast. And they call a TV timeout, which is fine, that's what's supposed to happen. Um, but everyone, and Renee especially, who's an old veteran, was like, let's just keep this going, let's keep this going. And, um, and so then, just to, by way of uh, one quick aside, is that we would plan every minute of every match, with every set break, everything detailed a full script of everything and the woman who ran our game day thing was if she had one fault is that she was too like she would she was so rigid that she would not be flexible about anything and so earlier that day i said i need to do two sponsor things she said we don't have any time for it and i was like well, we need to make time she said we don't have any time i said well make the time and i said please i actually write sign your check please uh <laughs> please make the time for this and I, I'm not sure I won that battle, to be honest, but she was so meticulous, and we had gone through with the league, with TV, every minute of everything that happened. So we're switching sides, we come out of the TV timeout, and then all of a sudden the announcer goes, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, we have an important announcement. I was like, what is the important announcement? Like, I know everything that's gonna happen. And someone wants to propose to one of our cheerleaders in the stands. And we're like, have all the momentum in the world. You talk about like icing the kicker, or icing the server, and, um, and I'm sitting there like, okay, now I'm romantic and I love love and everything else, but <laughs> this was not the time for this at all. And so Renee is like right in front of me like, come on, come on, I wanna go, we're winning, let's go. And I can just see, she's sort of just getting in. So um, he asked her to marry her. She said yes, so that was good. And um, I think they're happy, but, um, <laughs> and I hope that they are, but, this is what then happened. Renee goes and she double faults because she's like been sitting there. It's like a 10 minute break. She double faults and she's like sitting in front of me like freaking proposal. God, you know, like, and like, and this is literally pictures from her on TV about like what, you know, what happened. And so she starts, um, she starts going crazy. And, um, and we literally go from being up 3-1 in that set. We lose four straight games in about 10 minutes and we lose 5-3. And literally, that was the turning point. And this was a picture of me. <laughs> I'm sure one of the things I'm thinking is my key to the city. Um, and I'll tell you another just quick funny story. So, so you see the Geico caveman. I mean, this is like should be like a like a painting or something. But but uh, later that year at the U.S. Open, a friend of mine from business school is from South Africa. I see him, and he's like, he goes. Mark, he said, I was watching TV earlier this year, and I see you there, and you're sitting next to a gigantic <laughs> monkey. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I guess you guys don't have Geico in South Africa. <laughs> so, so, um, <laughs> so, uh, so that was that. So we, so we go in the last set, and we're only up by two games, which we have a lead, but I'm like, there is no way that this is going to happen. Um, and so, um, in fact, they go and reel off a 4-2 lead. So now it's 8-2 to two since the wedding proposal. 8-2, to two, and it's 40-15 uh, or 3-1. We play no ad scoring, so at deuce, the next point wins. So in effect, three match points. And I'm sitting there just going, I, cannot, I just can't believe this happened. And it literally happened because 
it, we just, everything turned at that moment. And we had done every, we had done every one of those seeds I talked about for six months, everything. We'd pay attention to every detail and that just, you know, stuff happens. And um, we're down three match points and I look over and the TV camera is on the other team's bench and they're interlocking arms like the moment of, vi like the victory camera celebration. And, uh, and I actually watched this last night because I just had to relive this. And, um, and uh, so first point, they play this long point, and Olga basically like, couldn't care less at this point just because she's so mad at what happens. And she hits a swinging volley that barely goes in. Like, it was literally like a shot, like, I just want to get this thing over with. And it falls in the court. And then, um, and then the other girl double faults. So now it's deuce, one more championship point. And they play this long point, and Olga hits a ball and hits the net, and it drops over. And we save three championship points. And you can see Murphy there, our coach. He, like, she's just pulled this off. The fans are going crazy. As I said, I watched this last night. It's insane. And, uh, you know, he's imparting every C in the book on her. Communication, culture, blah, blah, blah. Continuous improvement. Uh, but the thing turns, and, like, the players are – incredulous that this like this just happened because it looked like everything was over turns on dime and Olga all of a sudden gets this energy like you can't believe she's a new person and she comes back and she wins and we won and I've had great tennis people say I've watched that match they said you could play the match a hundred times and you would never win that match again and I agree um, it really was quite incredible the turnaround but also the little bit of luck that was involved and we celebrate we win the championship we get the key to the city, <laughs> and, uh, I w and uh, I, we don't have time, but at some point I'll tell you my key to the story, key to the city. It doesn't work, by the way, the key to the city. I tried. <laughs> but, um, but what this really is, is this all leads to people coming together, making a difference, being inspired, driving record-breaking financial results, winning championships, and making history. Thank you very much. That, that was awesome, Mark. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time because we have the eight companies yes. that are going to come and present. But I will say I was at that match. Yep. I saw Olga deliver. It was so exciting. It was uh, almost as exciting as watching the Giants beat the Patriots out in Arizona at the Super Bowl. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was awesome. It really was phenomenal. And, Thanks I want to thank you for, for coming, and uh, you, please, everybody, give a round of applause to Mark. <laughs>